Good evening. I am Miriam Abdul Kawi, and here's what's ahead for you on 7 News Tonight. BG Town Councilors alleged money mismanagement within their own council. Well, tonight, the Minister of Local Government says it was actually miscommunication. And another teenager murdered in the city. We'll tell you about the 18 year old left for dead in the cemetery. Plus, Rainforest Seafoods, they're a huge Caribbean corporation exporting marine products from Belize. But now, the allegation is that they've been busted with undersized kunk. We'll have the details. Also, former Prime Minister Dean Barrow weighs in on the legal opinion that senior operatives in the Briseño administration tried to sweep under the carpet. And fighting for on arrival and fighting for survival, BNTU's incoming president, Ruth Guerra, urges her members to trust her after a petition emerges to take her down. These stories and much more are ahead on 7 News tonight, so please stay tuned. Do remember this is not just a current event. It's somewhere in all of this, there's another pension plan for the boys. Michael Ashcroft claims that somewhere in all of the noise surrounding the three proposed sports projects is a pension plan for the boys. Well, think about it. They say the hog that balls is the hog that gets hit. As of late, leader of the opposition, Shine Barrow, seems to be doing a lot of balling. I believe that Royal Caribbean, they should look at the other stake bank or Waterloo. I have sung the praises of, of Waterloo. I have always supported um, Waterloo. I have gone on record to say that I thought that Waterloo was the best sport project. Mr. Leader of the Opposition, who is Ashcroft talking about? I guess he's rapping for yourself. Like, you don't sing rap. I'm singing for my supper. The real criminals are those in suit and tie. Babe, I'm going out to pay the water bill. You don't need to go out. You could pay it from your phone. Look. Babe, the credit card bill. I'll go pay. You can also pay it with your phone. Babe? Yes, love? I need to go deposit the baby series pay. You really want to go out, don't you? It's okay. I will make the transfer and you go play ball. With Atlantic Bank Mobile, your personal banking experience is easier and more convenient. Bank your way with any of our digital channels and save time for what matters most. Atlantic Bank. Building the future together. Dengue and Zika alert. Do your part by preventing mosquito breeding. The Ministry of Health reminds the public that as we enter the rainy season, be aware of the dangers of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. These are infectious diseases that are transmitted by the bite of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. These mosquitoes are most active in early morning and late afternoon. Activities that should be done to prevent dengue and Zika include avoid having containers that can collect water in your yard, Cover water storage containers such as drums. Change the water in flower pots every four or five days. These are ideal breeding sites for the mosquito. With the elimination of breeding sites in and around the yard, dengue and Zika can be avoided. Dengue and Zika begin with sudden onset of high fever. Other signs and symptoms include rash, joint pain, eye pain, if you are pregnant or planning to become pregnant, we advise you to visit your nearest health facility. The public is also encouraged to use mosquito repellent spray or lotion on the body or clothing. Do your part by preventing mosquito breeding.
legal advice. Legal advice. The legal advice. The continuing legal advice. Legal advice. Minister Kowe, you claimed you needed legal advice, but you had already gotten legal advice from Ben Duratovich, the British lawyer defending Belize against Guatemala at the ICJ. This is our attorney at the ICJ. The fate of our sovereign state depends on Ben Jaratovic. He prepared a 53-page legal opinion. The contract is simply unlawful, even if the government were to wish to maintain it. You understand this came on April 20th. The definitive agreement went to cabinet. Yes. Yeah. For its acceptance on May 17th, the government ignored it pushed it on the table and wished that the public would never see it or know of it. I believe they wish also that cabinet members, certain cabinet members would not know it or speak of it. I would rely entirely on the legal advice provided to the government. Minister Kowe, you want legal advice? See it, yeah? The government cannot, as a matter of principle, lawfully proceed on the basis of a contract, the content of which is unlawful. Like, what else do you need to hear? It, he could not say it more clearly. Minister Cohen, why were you still asking for legal advice two months after you had already received expensive legal advice from the British lawyer who told you that this contract was not just illegal, but unconstitutional? So what he's saying is that if you accept this contract, you're saying that individual members of parliament can vote how their people tell them to vote. They have to vote as this contract tells them. That's unconstitutional. Minister Kowe, why did you not disclose to your cabinet colleagues the legal opinion that the corrupt definitive agreement was unlawful? Why did you ask them to approve the definitive agreement and pass it into law? Why are you bringing all this heat on the government? Why, Minister, why? Fetting season is back again. Bully Soka Nation, get, get ready for the second annual J.I.J. Juve in July. We party from 10 p.m. until 4 a.m. on Saturday, July 8th at the Princess Ramada Pusa. Featuring the oldest to the latest in Soka and juggling by Belize's top DJ. Live performances by T.R. Shine, Ernestine Carvalho, Hilby, Coco the Boy, and John, hosted by DJ Dixie and John Lee. You wanted more water? Well, the pool is accessible for a swim. Tickets are thirty dollars in advance at all cellular world branches countrywide, and more at the gate. For more information, call 635-6695. It's Joe Bay in July on Saturday, July 8th in Police City at the Princess Ramada Poolside. Key Cocker, San Pedro, and Belize City are just a click away with Caribbean Sprinter. Avoid delays by getting your tickets and boarding passes online at sprinter.bz and welcome aboard. The Belize Tourism Board, Mars Production, and Bellican present the biggest show to hit the jewel we call Belize. It's the Belize International Music and Food Festival 2.0. Join us on Saturday, July 29th and Sunday, July 30th at the Marion Jones Stadium with live performances by Morgan Heritage. I'll be down by the river. The Dance Hall Queen, Spice. Me's a girl, me no fight over my mind. Busy Signal. Turn off of them stairs, so. Afro Beat Sensation Rotini. Dance all honors for 2023, Byron Messiah. Alongside Skinny Fabulous. International Music and Food Festival 2.0, July 29th and 30th. Come savor the rhythm as we pair music with the best of Belizean cuisine. Sponsors are Belize Tourism Board, Bellican, Niche, Pop, ICB, Wine Smith, E Cash, Dolphin Production, DigiWallet, Channel 5, Love FM, Krim Radio, Channel 7, Vibes Radio, Fiesta FM, and OYE Radio. Y'all ready for this? Ready.
ready or not, this is possibly the greatest fight in semi-pro basketball history. Scheduled for five brutal rounds. Let's get it on. Hurricanes with a vicious drive hook to the jaw of the Tiger Sharks in game one. Long but not out, Sharks answers with a massive left jab to lay out the Hurricanes in round two. Here comes the Hurricanes with a ferocious power shot to the body of the Tiger Sharks in round three. Back and forth they go. Who will win the decisive game four? They're playing bad, get this Friday night, July 7th at Millie Civic Center, starting at 9 p.m., is gonna be the battle between the three-time champion, San Pedro Tiger Sharks, and the two-time champ, Venice Belize Hurricanes, in an all-out war for game four. War in the heat. This game will be the biggest of the season. Two scoring franchises with multiple championships like the Celtics and the Lakers. It's the San Pedro Tiger Sharks, led by Francis Knighty Arana, Kyle Stewart, Jihad Wright, John Kelly, going up against the Venice Belize Hurricanes, who will answer with Clancy Cooper Lopez, Victor Vito Evans, Kirk Shabba Smith Jr., Alex the Legend Carcamo, Jamil Harris, and Chris Frazier. Will the Hurricanes close them out and win their third championship? Or Will the Hurricanes be eaten alive by the Tiger Sharks, forcing a decisive game five? Bring out the entire family this Friday night, June 7th. Sharks! Belize Civic Center, 9 p.m. sharp. Canes versus Tiger Sharks. Lots of giveaways, Tiger Sharks time. After party at Thursday, Thursday. Sponsors, Maya Island here, Duffin of Tours, West Trap, Sandy Point Resorts, Joseph and Taylor. Tiger Sharks with a call for the win again. Wake up to positivity and inspiration. It's a fresh and diverse twist on your mornings. Tune in to Sun Up on 7 every weekday morning at 6.30 a.m. Right here on your nation station, Channel 7. It's the morning show you don't want to miss. Please, you're watching the nation station, Channel 7. And starting things off with political news, is there money mismanagement in the Punta Gorda Town Council? That's what five councillors alleged in a signed letter to the Minister of Local Government one month ago on June 6th. They allege, quote, ongoing financial irregularities and unilateral decision making on expenditures of public funds, among other things. Today we spoke via telephone to the minister who received that complaint, Oscar Rikenya. And he said, it's not mismanagement, just miscommunication. After we received the letter, uh, I personally went to Punta Gorda along with our CEO and our local government director. That was on June the 15th. We had a meeting with the mayor and the town councillors. We discussed the issues that were raised in the letter. And an opportunity was afforded to everyone, you know, to express their concerns and whatever issues they had. I believe that the issues were ventilated and at the end of the meeting, all sides agreed, you know, to continue to work together. However, these people raised substantial issues of public concern that the public should be concerned about, which is our taxpayers' funds, our public funds being properly managed or are, are they being mismanaged as is claimed in the letter? I believe that the funds of the town council are being managed adequately. I believe that the issues raised were a matter of, you know, the mayor having more frequent meetings with the council. I believe that that is one of the major issues, and we did discuss that. However, these are these are these statements made by the in the letter. There is no resiling from them. They are they are declarations of what these people believe to be fact. The cost or, or deal to get uh, purchase of certain road equipment, the finances of the council. I understand that you are saying it's a communication issue. However, what the public sees in this is mismanagement of funds. And respectfully, what we're hearing from you is, okay, it's PUP council and, and a PUP minister of local 
government. Elections are near, and we can't rock the boat too much. We just have to try to get everybody on the same team. But will there be an audit of the funds spent? No, no, absolutely not, uh, Jules. I think you, you certainly have it wrong. Listen, as the Ministry of Local Government, we have responsibility for oversight for all town councils across the country. And that's why I started out my interview by saying that we provide monthly support and oversight to these town councils, particularly where, you know, we find town councils, you know, that are a little bit lacking. We go in there, we have been, you know, auditing their books, we are checking what they are doing. And, you know, where there are certain areas that have to be improved, we point that out to them, we hold them responsible to ensure that, you know, they meet the standards that are required of them. So, please, you know, we have a responsibility and we will execute our responsibility. I think it is important to point out to you that it's unfortunate that, you know, um, these allegations are out there. They were made by the councillors, but at the same time, I think during the meeting, it was made absolutely clear that, you know, with all the challenges that they have, and, you know, no council goes without any challenges. You're dealing with human beings. Should there, for the satisfaction of the public, be an audit of the financials of the town council? Listen, we are doing what we have to do, as I said, in terms of the oversight. If we find that necessary, then we will, we will certainly commission that. We'll keep monitoring that situation where we are reliably informed there are substantial claims of lack of accountability and reckless expenditure of public funds. The UDP today issued a release on this story saying, quote, this Brasenio administration has chosen to ignore credible allegations of corruption in municipal governments across the country, choosing instead to treat each allegation as party matters to be diffused by internal PUP mediation. While party intervention has helped to diffuse public spats, nothing has been done to address allegations of financial mismanagement and corruption in city and town councils across the country. The United Democratic Party call on Prime Minister Briseño to appoint financial controllers in the Punta Gorda, Belize City, Belmopan, Benque Viejo, and Corozal City and Town Councils. Meanwhile, last night, the headline was about a teenager who was gunned down over the weekend. And this morning, another teen was killed. 18-year-old Gabriel Tillett's body was found lying amidst a cluster of graves in the Lord Ridge Cemetery. Since the discovery, not much is known about the circumstances surrounding Tillett's demise, only that he was recently released from prison. Courtney Menzies has the story. This is the body of 18-year-old Gabriel Tillett. He was found lying in the Lord Ridge Cemetery just after 9.30 this morning with injuries to his head and body. His older brother identified his body while the police started their preliminary investigation. And after tonight, there are no leads yet as to who might have taken Tillett's life and why. However, Tillett was no stranger to the law. Back in September of 2022, Tillett was arrested and charged for the murder of 38-year-old Carl Lam. Lam was shot several times at the corner of Park Street and Lacroix Boulevard, and police indicated that it was gang-related. Tillett was remanded to prison in October of 2022, while he was still a minor. He went to court on May 5th and was set free, though we could not determine under what circumstances. But was Tillett targeted because of retaliation? That's what his family is waiting for the police to find out. But today, all his sister could do was watch as her brother was wrapped up in a body bag and carted off to the morgue. Courtney Menzies, 7 News. Tillett's family dec declined, that is, to comment. And while Tillett's family hopes for justice, so does the mother of the other slain teenager. As we reported, 16-year-old Jaffet Stamp was killed on Sunday morning after he went into a yard while armed with a gun. Before he could pull the trigger, someone else fired at him. Stamp ran a few feet before he collapsed, after which another man picked up the gun and shot 43-year-old Wayne Matura in the leg. Yesterday, you heard Stamp's mother saying he was set up and that he chose to be on the streets rather than in school. 
Well, today she came back to our studio to lament the death of her son, saying that the people who gave him the gun should be the ones behind bars. I'm going to paint my son wrong, brother. I'm going to paint my son like a gunman. I'm going to comment a whole heap of things under my son comments when I don't do my review. And I know where they're going, I don't know where they're going, but after the statics where I get over the night for news break, that the person when he shot, they know my son shot, you know. After they don't kill my son, brother, then the young man look like he take where the gun where he give my son. Figan that the people say, Figan, do some kind of talking. Put my son in a jeopardy for the cast, my son life. Yes, my son approach the yard with intention. What is intention? Because he get peer pressure, brother. He peer pressure my son in doing something he never ready for, brother. Then the young man still the out here, free. I don't understand why I dress my son the way he dressed my son, brother. I don't want to know who just my son feed it, brother. I don't want to send away yard where I don't know who one cool murderer is there, brother. Why don't you do that to me, poor pick? No, no, no. I don't know who my son just my son just in a room big is big clothes, brother. My son not just in a tight clothes, and I put tight clothes for my son. And then I put a gun for my son, and then people are see gun for my son and take my son like gun man. Police is saying it might be self-defense because you're the son. That's why you self-defense or no defense, brother. That's why you're not sent f in the picnic by peer pressure, brother. One next youth down the street, they wait for my son to come back, not knowing that my son will never come back, brother. Now tell me what peer pressure and self-defense. I mean, I want to comment on the comments that are chopping the son of my picnic. So far, no one has been arrested while shooting victim Wayne Matura is recovering in the hospital. And we take a break now, but when we come back, Jamaica's rainforest seafood caught with a trailer load of undersized conch in Belize. We'll have that story. And former Prime Minister Dean Barrow weighs in on the expose of the legal opinion government didn't want even its ministers to see. Stay tuned. Choose efficiency with Axic Switch technology only at Benny's Quality and Savings. Legal advice. Legal advice. The legal advice. The continuing legal advice. Legal advice. Minister Kowei, you claimed you needed legal advice, but you had already gotten legal advice from Ben Duratowicz, the British lawyer defending Belize against Guatemala at the ICJ. This is our attorney at the ICJ. The fate of our sovereign state depends on Ben Jaratovic. He prepared a 53-page legal opinion. The contract is simply unlawful, even if the government were to wish to maintain it. You understand this came on April 20th. The definitive agreement went to cabinet. Yes. Yeah. For its acceptance on May 17th, the government ignored it pushed it on the table and wished that the public would never see it or know of it. I believe they wished also that cabinet members, certain cabinet members, would not know it or speak of it. I would rely entirely on the legal advice provided to the government. Minister Kowei, you want legal advice? See it yeah? The government cannot, as a matter of principle, lawfully proceed on the basis of a contract, the content of which is unlawful. Like, what else do you need to hear? It, he could not say it more clearly. Minister Cohen, why were you still asking for legal advice two months after you had already received expensive legal advice from the British lawyer who told you that this contract was not just illegal, but unconstitutional? So what he's saying is that if you accept this contract, you're saying that individual members of parliament can't vote how their people tell them to vote, they have to vote as this contract tells them. That's unconstitutional. Minister Kowei. 
Why did you not disclose to your cabinet colleagues the legal opinion that the corrupt definitive agreement was unlawful? Why did you ask them to approve the definitive agreement and pass it into law? Why are you bringing all this heat on the government? Why, Minister, why? My Social Security. Your direct online access to all your social security information. 360 view of all your social security information. Registration services, benefits, contributions, and employer services at your fingertips. Enjoy all the new features with your My Social Security account. Register with SSB. Submission of benefit claims. Submission of contribution statements. View contribution record. Enjoy all your My Social Security feature at ssbportal.org.bz. Social Security at your fingertips. Babe, I'm going out to pay the water bill. You don't need to go out. You could pay it from your phone. Look. Babe, the credit card bill. I'll go pay. You can also pay it with your phone. Babe? Yes, love? I need to go deposit the baby service pay. You really want to go out, don't you? It's okay. I will make the transfer and you go play ball. With Atlantic Bank Mobile, your personal banking experience is easier and more convenient. Bank your way with any of our digital channels and save time for what matters most. Atlantic Bank, building the future together. Our biggest success is the fact that we are now Mali referee. For our country, it's a great achievement. I must thank our people who have been, had made this possible. This is a significant achievement for Belize, and in maintaining zero case for malaria is helping to reduce the impact on our people's health. I believe that what we're seeing currently is a testament to the arduous work, the commitment, and also the resilience of our people. Here in Belize, with all the difficulties we have and the challenges we have, it's our hearts that keep us driving to keep our people safe. Do remember this is not just a current event is somewhere in all of this, there's another pension plan for the boys. Michael Ashcroft claims that somewhere in all of the noise surrounding the three proposed sports projects is a pension plan for the boys. Well, think about it. They say the hog that balls is the hog that gets hit. As of late, leader of the opposition, Shine Barrow, seems to be doing a lot of balling. I believe that Royal Caribbean, they should look at the other stake bank or Waterloo. I have sung the praises of, of Waterloo. I have always supported um, Waterloo. I have gone on record to say that I thought that Waterloo was the best sport project. Mr. Leader of the Opposition, who is Ashcraft talking about? I guess he's rapping for yourself, like you don't sing rap. I'm singing for my suburb. The real criminals are those in suit and tie. This is possibly the greatest fight in semi-pro basketball history. Scheduled for five brutal rounds. Let's get it on. Hurricanes with a vicious right hook to the jaw of the Tiger Sharks in game one. Don't but not out. Sharks answers with a massive left jab to lay out the Hurricanes in round two. Here comes the Hurricanes with a ferocious power shot to the body of the Tiger Sharks in round three. Back and forth they go. Who will win the decisive game four? They're playing basketball. 
This Friday night, July 7th at Belize Civic Center, starting at 9 p.m., is going to be the battle between the three-time champion, San Pedro Tiger Sharks, and the two-time champ, Venice Belize Hurricanes, in an all-out war for Game 4. War in the heat. This game will be the biggest of the season. Two storied franchises with multiple championships like the Celtics and the Lakers. It's the San Pedro Tiger Sharks, led by Francis Knighty Arana, Kyle Stewart, Jihad Wright, John Kelly, going up against the Venice Belize Hurricanes, who will answer with Clancy Cooper Lopez, Victor Vito Evans, Kirk Shabba Smith Jr., Alex the Legend Carcamo, Jamil Harris, and Chris Frazier. Will the Hurricanes close them out and win their third championship? Or will the Hurricanes be eaten alive by the Tiger Sharks forcing a decisive game five? Bring out the entire family this Friday night, June 7th. Sharks. Belize Civic Center, 9 p.m. sharp. Canes versus Tiger Sharks. Lots of giveaways, Tiger Sharks style. After party at Thursday, Thursday. Sponsors, Maya Island here, Dolphin of Tours, West Trap, Sandy Point Resorts, Joseph and Taylor. Tiger Sharks with a confident win again. Wake up to positivity and inspiration. It's a fresh and diverse twist on your mornings. Tune in to Sun Up on 7 every weekday morning at 6.30 a.m. Right here on your nation station, Channel 7. It's the morning show you don't want to miss. Do remember this is not just a current event is somewhere in all of this there's another pension plan for the boys michael ashcroft claims that somewhere in all of the noise surrounding the three proposed sports projects is a pension plan for the boys well think about it they say the hog that balls is the hog that gets hit as of late leader of the opposition shine barrow seems to be doing a lot of balling i believe that royal caribbean they should look at the other stake bank or waterloo i have sung the praises of of waterloo i have always supported um, Waterloo. I have gone on record to say that I thought that Waterloo was the best sport project. Mr. Leader of the Opposition, who is Ashcraft talking about? I guess he's rapping for your supper. Can you not sing the rap? I'm singing for my supper. The real criminals are those in suit and tie. Babe, I'm going out to pay the water bill. You don't need to go out. You could pay it from your phone. Look. Babe, the credit card bill. I'll go pay it. You can also pay it with your phone. I need to go to Positive Baby Series Pay. You really want to go out, don't you? It's okay. I will make you transfer and you go play ball. With Atlantic Bank Mobile, your personal banking experience is easier and more convenient. Bank your way with any of our digital channels and save time for what matters most. Atlantic Bank. Building the future together. Please. You're watching The Nation Station, Channel 7. Rainforest Seafood. It's a Caribbean corporation operating out of Jamaica, but with a base here in Belize. But for the past week, the company has been under scrutiny. That's because multiple reliable reports to 7 News over the past week confirm that the company is being investigated for trying to ship out more than 3,000 pounds of conch that did not meet the minimum 3-ounce weight requirement. Our reports say that in a week-long pull-down of the container, which was bound for export, fisheries officers found over 20,000 conch that did not meet the weight requirement. Now, if these figures are accurate, at a minimum of $50 per conch, 
the company could be facing a fine of over a million dollars. And the public will say if it was an ordinary small fisherman, he would have already been dragged before the magistrate. So what will happen with Rainforest Seafoods? Well, the CEO in the Ministry of the Blue Economy told us today, quote, that matter is under investigation and will go through the legal process with advice from the DPP's office. Other than that, we cannot disclose any more information at this moment. The fisheries department is very busy doing its due diligence. As soon as more concrete information is available, our ministry will be issuing a press release. We also tried to contact the company's general manager and its attorney, who told us he will ascertain the facts and respond tomorrow. Persons with a knowledge of the situation have told us that the conch did meet the weight requirement when it was caught, but when they were blast frozen for export, there was shrinkage. We'll keep following this story and bring you updates. Meanwhile, last night, 7 News broke the story about the legal opinion that it appears the government didn't want its own minister to see, much less the public. That's the opinion penned in May of 2020 by Ben Jurwatowicz, government's lead attorney in the ICJ defense of our territory, and also an expert on arbitration and commercial law. One man who has studied the findings in that opinion closely is former Prime Minister Dean Barrow. That's because two weeks ago he reached the same conclusion as Jurwatowicz. The definitive agreement is illegal because it seeks to bind the parliament, which no agreement can do. That's what Barrow put out in a statement on June 16th when Minister Francis Fonseca reported to the House of Representatives that they had another legal opinion which stated that the UDP's Erwin Contreras have the legal authority to sign a definitive agreement. Barrow said, quote, this is a contract that purported to fetter, to bind parliament. That alone made it patently illegal, utterly void. Jurachowicz told government the same in April. Barrow, whose government had also retained Jurachowicz, discussed that legal opinion with us today. His conclusion on unenforceability in consequence of the illegality constituted by the violation of the separation of powers doctrine. The fact that the minister and therefore the executive contracted to produce, to, to, to have parliament pursue a certain course of action and to have parliament produce a particular result that you will see that Dr. Juratowicz said is absolutely beyond the pale. So that was the coup de grace, that, that was the kill shot. And in terms of that kill shot, he made it plain, there can be no argument. End of story, that definitive, so-called definitive agreement is unenforceable, it is illegal, it is void. I thought that was absolutely the way to finish. And he finished not with a flourish, but with an emphatic punto final. But that is not the end of it for the prime minister. We expect that he may have some answering to do to his cabinet colleagues and the public about why government did not just follow this legal advice back in April, advice which they are only just now following after the prime minister's ministry tried to get the definitive agreement through cabinet. But why take such a perilous political course for a manifestly fraudulent document the former prime minister gave his take on it today. There is no way the prime minister can explain how having Dratovich's opinion, which concluded on such a clear, unambiguous note, he could go to cabinet, and I don't want to hear that Chris Coy prepared 
the cabinet paper or Stuart Leslie or maybe the good financial secretary. It doesn't matter. That I was there. That paper goes under the hand of the prime minister. It is his paper. He will, in fact, introduce it uh, during the cabinet conclave. He might invite his minister of state to say something to add to the argument, but it is his paper. And it is inexplicable that the prime minister could have taken such a paper to cabinet, enjoining cabinet to approve the definitive agreement on the basis that it was binding and non-approval would expose the cabinet to liability when Dr. Juratowicz's opinion to the contrary was so very clear. His reasons for doing that, it beggars belief that he could have done that innocently. There can be no innocence about that. That obviously had to be deliberate. And why the prime minister would do such a thing, in fact, is clearly tied up with all the noise we've been hearing about uh, special interests and about connections and that sort of thing. In any case, how now can he say to members of cabinet, there is a reasonable explanation, there is any explanation at all for my doing that? The noise that Barrow refers to is countered by the government, which says it has chosen to stick with the Portico plan for a cruise ship facility because it has strong partners and a plan that works. That's fine and well, but why did they first try and stick with the definitive agreement? Barrow gave his best guess today. There has to be some irresistible attraction to the original definitive agreement. If one gets very... Um, if one receives very practical legal advice that, okay, plan A won't work, but you can do plan B, and here's how to do plan B. Why wouldn't the government have taken that advice then? Why would they instead try to slip by with the dirty definitive agreement with all its known defects and the taint of UDP corruption that was on it? Because clearly... That definitive agreement, how shall I put it carefully, if not delicately, is worth more, sir, to its supporters than any recrafted agreement will be worth. And Barrow, who has weathered a few storms himself, says in his estimation, this is a body blow for Prime Minister Brisenio. I can't recollect any Prime Minister being in as, as much in, in a pickle as, as these circumstances constitute for the current Prime Minister. You just cannot explain that. The members of cabinet, like the members of the public, can only come to one conclusion. And in my view, that conclusion makes the prime minister's continued tenure untenable. He will no doubt stay politics being what it is, but his moral authority, assuming he had any, is irretrievably <laughs> damaged. There is no recovering the huge ground that he has lost. His colleagues are aware of the larger issue at play. His colleagues know 
that as the good Mike Lashcroft has said, this is another pension plan for the boys with the difference that it is a pension plan for only some of the boys. So I almost, I, 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 I wish the Prime Minister well, but I do not see how he can get away from this one. And while Barrow speculates freely on the possible fallout for Prime Minister Brisenio, the UDP is also tainted by the Portico arrangements. Both former UDP ministers, Erwin Contreras and Hugo Pat, have been implicated by association. Pat is alleged to have played a part in the facilitation of lands over Portico just a week before the 2020 elections. Barrow revealed his sentiments today on the matter. The facilitation, presumably offered by Hugo Pat, who was a deputy prime minister at the time, who it is alleged facilitated, we've seen the documents, facilitated the sale and transfer of uh, hundreds of acres into Portugal. Um, certainly suspicious activity one week before the election. What was your reaction when you saw that? I was very, very disappointed. Uh, he and I weren't especially close. But with Hugo Pat, it's a different matter. I really and truly liked Hugo Pat very, very much when the Commission of Inquiry stuff happened. I represented him, as you know. Uh, I had felt that Ugo was the kind, I don't want to sound naive, that Ugo was the kind of individual who would keep his, who would not drop the ball, not in any noticeable, unmistakable, dramatic fashion. Uh, so that when that material emerged, I was, I, w I was disappointed. Um, but it's water under the bridge, that's so I have to see it. We are long gone from the scene. I certainly am long gone. It's beginning to seem like an eternity you now with all this stuff that's happening. And so um, being an older and wiser fellow, I'm not going to... I'm not going to uh, get into, I'm not going to torment myself with, as it were, trying to do some kind of uh, sitting judgment over Ugo. Uh, I, I won't, I will not go beyond saying that I was disappointed at what emerged. And Barrow also cannot escape from the actions of his former senior minister, Erwin Contreras, who put the whole play in motion by signing the definitive agreement. He commented on Contreras' folly today. It puts one in the mind of what was Erwin Contreras thinking? No, we have had this thought for long because We've all reviewed the definitive agreement and its odious clauses. I don't want to just say unlawful, but um, it's almost something lawless to sign something like this. It has an attitude, a lawless approach. It is inexplicable. There is no excuse for it. There's no explanation for it. It is just a really bad boat of moral and practical insanity. I regret that that is the only conclusion anybody can draw because Erwin Contreras 
is a very personable, collegial sort of fellow. And he was for so many years unbeatable in his constituency, which must have meant that there were good things he did for the constituency. People liked him. And it's a pity, even though he's out of politics, to see him retrospectively brought so low. I therefore regret that it has happened, but there it is. He, truth to tell, brought it upon himself. Erwin Contreras has not responded to various requests for comment. And we take a break now, but when we come back, Ruth Showman, she's taken over as new president of the BNTU, but now she's trying to win hearts and minds after a recall petition was started against her. You'll hear her plea to teachers. Stay tuned. Do remember this is not just a current event. It's somewhere in all of this, there's another pension plan for the boys. Michael Ashcroft claims that somewhere in all of the noise surrounding the three proposed sports projects is a pension plan for the boys. Well, think about it. They say the hog that balls is the hog that gets hit. As of late, leader of the opposition, Shine Barrow, seems to be doing a lot of balling. I believe that Royal Caribbean, they should look at the other State Bank or Waterloo. I have sung the praises of, of Waterloo. I have always supported um, Waterloo. I have gone on record to say that I thought that Waterloo was the best sport project. Mr. Leader of the Opposition, who is Ashcroft talking about? I guess he's rapping for yourself. Like, you don't sing, you rap. I'm singing for my suburb. The real criminals are those in suit and tie. Dear people of Belize, the World Health Organization has certified Belize as malaria free, and I want to congratulate your country, the government, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and the National Vector Control Program for its leadership, determination, and the commitment to pursue and finally achieve the elimination of malaria. This is an extraordinary achievement for Belize, and it will also serve as inspiration for the other endemic countries in the Americas. I must also extend my congratulations to the health personnel who for decades dedicated their work to eliminating this disease in the community health workers, voluntary collaborators, and other actors engaged in the fight against malaria. Belize's success story is a testament to the strengthening core strategies and health system implemented since the 2000s. Belize reported the last indigenous case in 2018, and it has since demonstrated a strong commitment to consolidating and maintaining core interventions and strategies to prevent the reestablishment of malaria. Following the achievement of Paraguay, Argentina, and El Salvador, Belize becomes today the fourth country in the Americas and the second in the Central America to be certified as free of malaria over the last five years. There is a great possibility that the elimination of malaria in Central America may turn into reality thanks to the country efforts and key partnerships in the region. We also recognize Suriname, Mexico, and Dominican Republic as countries in the Americas that are currently approaching the final stages towards the elimination of malaria. I would like to encourage Belize authorities to sustain their remarkable achievement in malaria elimination to continue to advance in the disease elimination initiative promoted by PAHO and be a model to the rest of the region. The people of Belize should be proud of this success, and I especially would like to thank those partners who contributed to the elimination process. Congratulations to all, and thank you. Legal advice, legal advice, the legal advice, the continuing legal advice, legal advice. Minister Cohen, 
You claimed you needed legal advice, but you had already gotten legal advice from Ben Duratovich, the British lawyer defending Belize against Guatemala at the ICJ. This is our attorney at the ICJ. The fate of our sovereign state depends on Ben Juratovic. He prepared a 53-page legal opinion. The contract is simply unlawful, even if the government were to wish to maintain it. You understand oh, this came on wow. April 20th. The definitive agreement went to cabinet. Yes. Yeah. For its acceptance on May 17th, the government ignored it, pushed it on the table, and wished that the public would never see it or know of it. I believe they wish also that cabinet members, certain cabinet members, would not know it or speak of it. I would rely entirely on the legal advice provided to the government. Minister Kowi, you want legal advice? See it ya? The government cannot, as a matter of principle, lawfully proceed on the basis of a contract, the content of which is unlawful. Like, what else do you need to hear? It, he could not say it more clearly. Minister Kowi, why were you still asking for legal advice two months after you had already received expensive legal advice from the British lawyer who told you that this contract was not just illegal, but unconstitutional? So what he's saying is that if you accept this contract, you're saying that individual members of parliament can vote how their people tell them to vote, they have to vote as this contract tells them. That's unconstitutional. Minister Kowi, why did you not disclose to your cabinet colleagues the legal opinion that the corrupt definitive agreement was unlawful? Why did you ask them to approve the definitive agreement and pass it into law? Why are you bringing all this heat on the government? Why, Minister, why? Babe, I'm going out to pay the water bill. You don't need to go out. You could pay it from your phone. Look. Babe, the credit card bill. I'll go pay it. You can also pay it with your phone. Babe? Yes, love? I need to go to Positive Baby Series Pay. You really want to go out, don't you? It's okay. I will make the transfer and you go play ball. With Atlantic Bank Mobile, your personal banking experience is easier and more convenient. Bank your way with any of our digital channels and save time for what matters most. Atlantic Bank. Building the future together.
Belize, you're watching The Nation Station, Channel 7. And it felt like 2020 all over again when the Belize City Magistrate's Court closed early today because of a COVID scare. The virus is no longer considered a pandemic, and there have been, there have not been, that is, any restrictions or reported deaths recently. Still, the court's Coney Drive office closed at noon to sanitize the area after a security guard tested positive for COVID-19. The closure was a precautionary measure taken by the newly appointed chief magistrate, Jayani Wiganapola, to ensure the safety of her staff. The security guard appeared to be asymptomatic, but since he has been in constant contact with those who use the court, a number of persons will also need to be tested. This video is like a scene out of March 2020 when cleaning companies decked out in their hazmat suits were sanitizing every office that reported an outbreak. But the court will only be closed for today and will be reopened tomorrow. And turning our attention now to one of our top stories, Ruth Showman assumed her duties at BTN, BTN, BNTU, that is, president this week, but is facing a fight upon taking action. A faction of the union, mainly from the South, is attempting to force an investigation of her ascension to the post, leading, they hope, to her ouster form, the union and its paramount post. Last night, Showman went live on Facebook with a response to the campaign. BNTU President Ruth Schumann's transition into office was met with backlash from several concerned BNTU members. They claim that her presidency violates the BNTU's constitution. Her opponents are gathering signatures, seeking a petition and judicial revision, attempting to block the presidency of their newly elected leader. On her first day in office, Schumann went live yesterday evening to galvanize support from the union. Teachers I, and members, I have been placed in this position not to, not to bring anything other than unity, other than what you deserve. For years, I have been serving the BNTU. It is not now. Um, I started as a staff rep for my school <clears throat> over 15 years ago, and I have served in various capacities throughout. Mm -hmm. One thing I must be consistent, and I have been throughout my service to BNTU, is that I've always put the best interests of our members before anything else. And with that, I've been consistent, which has led to various attacks on my person in the past. And that is okay, because that's part of what we do. That will not change. Schumann claims that she knew prior to being elected president that people would have used her past against her. Schumann faced criminal charges in 1998 for theft and admitted to stealing $110,000 from Island Marketers LTD and Belize Yacht Club in San Pedro. She was ordered to pay $81,028 in 2000 by the Supreme Court. Despite this, Schumann adds that her past will not overshadow the work she wishes to accomplish within the BNTU. With that said, I'll say that as it pertains to all the incidents that have been going back and forth, what I will say is that whatever is out there was something that transpired when I was a teenager, quarter of a century ago, and long before I became a teacher. I know that Holding this position opens myself to attacks, and that is okay. We live in a democratic country, and everyone is entitled to have a voice. I don't plan on silencing anyone's voice. As a matter of fact, as unionists, we are 
creating from the bedrock of democracy, justice, having a voice for the voiceless. So I will not silence or attempt to silence anyone who has a voice in this country, but I will also not waste any precious time in trying to answer to things that don't help the union and will not push the work of the union forward either. We'll keep following this story and bring you updates. Meanwhile, almost one year ago, the BDF soldiers stationed at the Sarstoon Forward Operating Base had to temporarily relocate because the base was in danger of falling into the sea. Erosion had left it practically unlivable, but the BDF assured Belizeans that the area would still be patrolled 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. However, according to the leader of the Belize Territorial Volunteers, BTV, Will Mejia, that hasn't been happening. He told us today that the base has been practically abandoned. Meanwhile, the Guatemalan armed forces are stepping up their presence in the area. And to prevent them from completely encroaching, Mejia says the BTV will be occupying the FOB in the meantime while it's being fixed, which he hopes will be soon, since he says it shouldn't be taken this it shouldn't have taken this long, that is, to begin with. We spoke with him via Zoom. The BTV has been around for a while now and um, we believe that it was because of our lobbying efforts that the forward operating base was put at the mouth of the SARS too, and the results was immense. You know, the illegal fishing was reduced. There are more marine life in the area, more fish for the fishermen of the south of fish. So it's also an economic benefit, economic and social benefit, an environmental benefit to all Belizeans. So it was of concern to us when the BDF uh, basically abandoned the forward operating base. There was a release last year that said, uh, from the government that said that the base would be temporarily um, inactive for renovation. Well, it's under uh, over a year now. We have taken engineers to the um, forward operating base who find that it is still suitable for people to um, live in. Um, yes, there is some erosion taking place, but the base is strong enough and still um, livable. And we noticed that the uh, Guatemalan armed forces continue to have their presence on the Sarstoon. In fact, they have expanded their base on the Sarstoon while we abandon our base. So we, the territorial volunteers, believe that it is very important for us to maintain a presence on the Sarstoon and on the Sarstoon Island. So after we met a few weeks ago or months ago, we decided, look, if the government is not going to do anything with the forward operating base, we are going to occupy the base to show that Belize does have a presence on the Sarstoon. And it's not like no mansion that's down there. It's a 20 by 24 building. In one weekend, that building could, that, that seawall could be put in. We, the Belize Territorial Volunteers, had actually written to the commandant of the, um, of the BDF and basically saying like the Territorial Volunteers are willing to help to reconstruct the seawall so that the um, military could return to the base. Well, they didn't uh, take that. And, you know, um, it's not rocket science. We have Ewart Garbutt and all those volunteers who saved Seal Key, a whole entire island. And they did that in a matter of a month. And we, or with our military, it's been like going on a year and our base has totally been abandoned while the Guatemalans have expanded their station there. Their station, their pier, their dock has gotten bigger. So they are establishing more of a presence in their area and they're stretching it over to our area. The last time we spoke with Minister Florencio Marin was back in March, and he said that there was an allocation for the renovations in the budget and that the process of repairs would take six months. And while Mejia is waiting to see when the base will be renovated, he's also waiting to hear about the redistricting process. That's because even though the Belize's Pro Progressive Party is one of the entities that took the issue to court, they have not been given a seat on the redistricting task force. And Mejia also worries that though this issue is supposed to be free of politics, there is still some gerrymandering happening. He told us more about it today.
Uh, you know, uh, I was one of the ones who took the government to court for to force the redistricting exercise. And, you know, right now we hear the leader of the opposition crying like a baby over there about all the injustices and re uh, gerrymandering. Well, he should have been doing this 10 or 15 years ago because it's about 10 or 15, about 15 years now that we have been calling on both governments, PUP and UDP, to have a redistricting exercise. How we want to encourage the elections and boundaries to make it fair, not to politicians, but to all Belizeans, because at the end of the day, this is about Belize, and we need voter equity in this country. So stop the gerrymandering, and let's make voting um, fair to all Belizeans. To take key cocker and putting it, sticking it into Fort Judge, that's like totally ridiculous. There's two different cultures. There's It's exactly what we've been seeing here in the Toledo district for years. You have Bea Vista and you have Punta Gorda Town, two different cultures, two different ethnic groups in the same um, Toledo East. You have to go through to, um, from Toledo East, you have to go through Toledo West to get back to Toledo East to vote for um, the area rep in Toledo East. It makes absolutely no sense. We feel, you know, we as the litigants in that case, we feel disrespected because we were the ones who took it to court and they have not informed us. They keep saying, oh, um, there are uh, members on the commission. But none of the BPP members are on this commission. None of the people who um, took the government to court are on that commission, which I believe that we should be on that commission because we are the one who took the initiative to take it to court to make voting um, fair in this country. But we have been like sidelined. And now you see the fight between the PUP and the UDP, which, like I said, again, the leader of the opposition or I know of the UDPs that's complaining now should have been complaining about this 20 years ago. And redistricting is one of the signal issues for the leader of the opposition, Shine Barrow. In fact, he has put out a 17-minute statement on it. But that didn't take away time from penning a lengthy response to Royal Caribbean Cruise Line's VP of Destination Development, Joshua Carroll, who wrote to him two weeks ago. Barrow tells Carroll, quote, you are collaborating with Portico, an utterly discredited company that executed a fraudulent agreement with a government official. And adds, the list of Portico's fraudulent and questionable dealings continue to grow each week. He notes, quote, I am heartened, therefore, to hear that RCG will undertake additional due diligence on the project because there is obviously much that it could not uncover the first time around due to the duplicity and mendacity which birthed the Portico Agreement. Barrow says he will meet with the Royal Caribbean team when they come to Belize. Meanwhile, was the Marshallic Commission of Inquiry and Political Misadventure plotted by the Brasenio administration? Prime Minister John Brasenio shared with the media on Friday that he is disappointed at the fact that a procedural error was made, an error that is now costing taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars. But Brasenio says that the legal liabilities racked up have to do with procedural failings, not a fault in factual findings. Dean Barrow, who has successfully sued the commission, disagrees. Here are both sides in detail. These former ministers were not fighting to say that we were innocent. They were just saying, you did not give me a chance to come in front of the commission. It was a procedural error. And I'm disappointed that that, that that procedural error was done because now it is costing us. If these people were given a lot an opportunity to be able to come, there would have been no reason why they would be able to, to challenge um, that, that, that report. The point of the matter is that the report was factual. They're not fighting on the facts, they're fighting on the procedure. And that's important to point out. What they said was that Godwin Hulse had acquired a Mahindra, and that was simply not true. Godwin Hulse bought his own Mahindra. It had nothing to do with uh, an acquisition of a fleet that was with vehicle management. So, so what is the Prime Minister talk talking about? He was not even called before the Commission, so he had no chance to say to the Commission, no, no, you're talking about, no, man, my Mahindra is what I went to the store and bought. So that right away explodes the nonsense that the Prime Minister is talking. And so the Prime Minister cannot get away from the fact that that was a massive monumental cock-up.
And finally, according to Barrow, he has not received any payments from the current administration, which is appealing the quantum of the award. An emergency response team was dispatched out to mile 63 on the Banque Viejo Road less than an hour ago after an SUV and a motorcycle collided during the evening traffic. Reports suggest that the driver and passenger of the motorcycle were injured and rushed to the San Ignacio Hospital for treatment. The identities of the persons involved in the accident have not been revealed. No fatalities have been reported at this time. We'll continue to follow this story and bring you updates, but that's 7 News tonight. Thanks so much for watching. I am Miriam abdul Kawi. You can find a full transcript of the news at 7newsbelize.com and see streaming video on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Good night, stay safe, and join me back here tomorrow at 6.